Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Fort Collins Comic Con and the first of our science talks this morning. I'm Carolyn Collins Peterson, and I organize these science talks among for, for this con and also for a couple of others. And this morning, we're going to start off with Dr. Ken Carpenter from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And he's going to talk to us about um, NASA and, a, and an age of, of space astrophysics. And the title of his talk is An Enterprising Voyage of Discovery Through Deep Space and Time. Now, Ken is an old friend of mine. He's, he, he and I were on the same instrument team on Hubble Space Telescope, and he continues to work with Hubble as its operations project scientist. And he's also the ground system project scientist for the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which he's gonna be telling us about. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ken so he can tell you what's going on at NASA these days. Ken? Thank you very much, Carolyn. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here and hopefully you can see this as I go into slide mode. You got my slides? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, welcome to everybody uh, who's here today. Thank you for showing up. And as Carolyn said, I'd like to try to walk, uh, walk you through NASA's uh, current and future uh, near future planned strategic astrophysics missions. And by strategic, just to be clear here, I mean the large missions. Uh, what in the past has been called great observatories. Uh, the, there was four original observatories in that line and we're continuing on now with similar size observatories, uh, but just referring to them as strategic missions, basically missions that cost over a uh, billion dollars or so um, and are a real serious commitments uh, by the agency into the astrophysical science. So I'm gonna start off today with the Chandra X-ray Observatory, first of the two currently operating missions. Um, obviously from its name, uh, it's an X-ray Observatory. It's been up there now for 21 years. You see the uh, patch here on the right side of the screen uh, from their 20th anniversary last year in 2019. So they've been going uh, quite well. The strategic missions um, are just going gangbusters. Uh, Hubble is now in its 30th year. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but these two are going strong and they're nice and complementary. Chandra looks at higher energy, uh, bluer color wavelengths than Hubble can see. So having both observatories available to look at similar objects gives you a much clearer picture, more detailed picture of what's going on. Uh, with the physics of the objects. This is a uh, cartoon of Chandra and hopefully you can see my uh, cursor here moving around uh, right now over the sunshade door. Um, X-ray telescopes are a little different from what we're used to in the sense that uh, for an optical telescope you're used to even having a lens at the top focusing light down the tube or a mirror at the bottom that collects light that's gone down a tube and it bounces back and forth to get to the instruments. With an X-ray telescope, you have a mirror, but it's a set of concentric cylinders which funnel the light down and focus it much like a refracting lens would be for optical light. So the very top of the tube here, you see this uh, cylindrical setup of very high angular uh, incidence X-ray mirrors which direct the light down the tube to the instruments. You got the required solar arrays, of course, uh, a sunshade door if you start pointing too close to the sun, some thrusters to help in the attitude control, uh, and then all of the instrumentation at the bottom with the spectrometer uh, and the high resolution camera. Okay, by the numbers, nice summary of, of uh, what Chandra has done, collected 23 trillion bytes of data over the, the first 20 years. Uh, it's about 14 meters in length. It's about the size of a school bus, very similar uh, to Hubble in that regard. It's made in the first 20 years, 2,700 trips around the earth um, and traveled 2.4 billion kilometers. It goes around um, the earth in 63 hours. Um, takes longer than, than Hubble does to do that. And it's supported by 3.6 million lines of code to operate, collect, and analyze the data. And it's used by about 4,300 scientists around the world. So as with Hubble, both observatories are very international in flavor. Um, US observers can propose and get funding to support their research. Anyone from anywhere around the world 
can also uh, propose to get time on the telescope, but they need to propose to their local foundations to get the monetary support uh, to do the data reduction. And apologies for the density of, of this one, uh, but the science by the numbers here um, gives you a, a sampling of the wide variety of things uh, that we've done. I don't think I wanna read through all of these, um, but uh, mention that we have observed three supernova remnants uh, with Chandra, uh, explosions that you can't see uh, with the unaided eye. Um, well, what's other good thing? Expansion speed per hour of a blast wave in a supernova remnant, 32 million miles uh, per hour. Just an incredible, violently uh, strong expulsion of matter from this particular uh, supernova. Um, what else is unusual here? Number of sun masses in the El Gordo galaxy cluster, three quintillion. Uh, again, these are some of the largest numbers seen in their various uh, categories, which is why I am um, calling them out. Um, this is an interesting little tidbit too, the number of hydrogen bombs that would, need, that would be needed to produce the energy a quasar releases in every second. And that's a hundred million quadrillion, just uh, an insane amount. These uh, quasars with active nuclei in their centers with huge black holes are just incredible energy, energy producers. Um, and it goes on and on. You can uh, read some of this yourself as we go through here, um, but I don't think I will go through all of them right here. The, the idea is that in 20 years, Chandra has done an incredibly wide variety of science and seen some of the most amazing uh, physics out there. And I thought I would just go through a, a couple of uh, brief illustrations um, of individual science results. And here's an observation of Sparks 1049, which is actually a collaborative observation between Chandra, Hubble, and Spitzer, which is another, Spitzer is another great observatory that works in the infrared, so that you have Chandra at the high energy X-ray end, Hubble in the center in the ultraviolet and optical, and Spitzer out at the cooler end in the uh, infrared uh, part of the spectrum. So together you can piece together a very broad range of wavelengths. And the thing that's unusual uh, about this area is you see a huge burst of star formation in this relatively old cluster. That doesn't normally happen because the active nucleus at the center uh, prevents the material from cooling down enough to collect into stars. In this case, the active uh, nucleus at the center of the black hole is, is dead, dormant, not actually um, heating up anything. So the material around it can cool down and go into this huge burst of star formation instead of being heated up by the central engine. Uh, Chandra also, uh, in one of its more famous uh, results, tried to test the theory of everything, more generally known as uh, string theory, looking for the sign of axion particles, uh, which you can do by, again, looking at a broad range of wavelengths and looking to see uh, the X-ray spectrum uh, of an object would be expected to change if you detected these axion particles, but it would be proof uh, if found that string theory is in some sense uh, a valid physical model. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find evidence of axions in this case, so string theory remains a theoretical concept at the moment um, that we're still trying to, to verify in, in one of its variants. Okay, moving on to Hubble. Uh, you see there our little badge on the right side, which commemorates 30th anniversary, which is happening this year in April. It was the 30th anniversary um, of Hubble, uh, 30th anniversary of the launch. And uh, to do Hubble by the numbers here, um, launch date, 24th of April, 1990. It was launched on Space Shuttle Discovery, uh, Space Transportation System 31 launch. It weighs about 24,000 pounds, 14 feet in diameter, length of 43 feet, uh, 13 meters, so a little bit shorter than Chandra, uh, at launch at least. It or orbits 340 miles up and goes around the Earth once every 95 minutes. Uh, 
So it's moving uh, pretty fast, 17,000 miles per hour, and goes around about 15 orbits a day. Over its lifetime, uh, one of the reasons that Hubble has remained such a groundbreaking, groundbreaking observatory um, is that we were, have been able to go up and service it. This was particularly critical at the beginning when, uh, as you might remember, Hubble uh, was discovered to have a mirror that was ground to very precisely to a slightly wrong shape. And that was enough to blur the images. So on the first servicing mission um, back uh, down here, we were able to go in, uh, put in a new camera with corrective optics in it and put in something called CoStar, which was a replacement instrument design to change the uh, optical uh, focusing of light going to the remaining instruments inside. So on that mission, we were able to restore Hubble um, to its uh, designed um, op operational optical specifications. And one of the engineers uh, on board at Hubble at the time said that he was utterly shocked that it came out so well that we have basically corrected the optics uh, to a degree, to the, the maximum possible degree permitted by the laws of physics. And that was just so exciting to hear. So we're back to our design specs. We also put on some new gyros. Uh, gyros are the thing that wear out more often on Hubble than anything else on board. And we put on a, a second, a new version of the solar arrays because we were having trouble with them flexing as we went in and out of uh, daylight. Uh, we would do that uh, later on in one of the later service submissions, we actually changed the design of the arrays because we continued to have problems with that after servicing mission one. Servicing mission two, we went in and put in two new cameras, a space telescope imaging spectrograph and the near infrared camera uh, and some new fight and guidance sensors that are used to guide the te telescope from target to target and keep it pointed at a target while we're there. Service mission 3A, I was called up on an emergency basis. We were gonna do servicing mission three a little bit later. We split uh, mission three into 3A and 3B, went up with what we had ready on 3A because we needed to replace all of the gyros they had. Um, they were rapidly failing. So we pulled mission 3A, part of it up as early as we could do it, put in the gyros, put in an advanced computer that was ready and another fine guidance sensor. Uh, later on, a couple of years later, we did the rest of the mission where we put an advanced camera uh, for surveys, uh, another new instrument, uh, some new generation solar arrays off the Iridium um, production line. So no longer custom arrays like we're using on Hubble. These new arrays that I put on in 3B were uh, very rigid, didn't have the problem of flexing when we went in and out of daylight and were relatively inexpensive since they came off the Iridium production line. We didn't have to do a, a custom build on that. We replaced a power control unit and put in a cooling system for the infrared NICMOS uh, camera system. And then we uh, had intended to go in in the early 2000s and do a servicing mission four, the final mission that got delayed um, by the uh, Columbia accident uh, while NASA figured out a way to safely go back to Hubble uh, without endangering the lives of the astronauts. Uh, to, you know, more than, more, more than usual. Uh, eventually uh, that was worked out. Uh, we were able to go up and we had, because there was such a break between servicing mission 3B and four, we had a huge agenda of items to do. We put in gyros as always, a new science command and data handler, a new camera, a new spectrograph, very sensitive ultraviolet spectrograph, batteries, fine guidance sensor. We repaired to existing instruments, put some uh, insulation, replace some insulation on the outer part of the telescope and put a mechanism on the bottom of the telescope that would allow us to capture the telescope robotically in the future for deorbiting or for kicking into a higher orbit um, if needed. So that's the uh, history of Hubble in a nutshell. Here I wanna show you some of the things that we did uh, for Hubble's 30th anniversary. And the first thing, which was kind of fun, is we put invites out to some celebrities to create some videos uh, to wish Hubble a happy birthday. And we'll switch over to the Twitter story here, which has it. And let me uh, turn on the sound. Happy birthday. And start this from the beginning happy for you. Happy birthday 
birthday to you. Hubble, happy birthday. Happy anniversary, Hubble. Hubble Space Telescope, happy 30th birthday. Happy 30th birthday, Hubble. Happy birthday, Hubble. Happy birthday to the Hubble Telescope on its 30th. The Hubble Space Telescope has been showing us a whole new world for 30 years now. 30 years old, crazy. You allowed me to gaze at galaxies and wander into the heavens through pictures. You're beloved by the world, and I think I know why. You not only imagine what's out there in the heavens, but then you go looking for it. You know, what do you, what, what do you get the telescope that has everything? Am I right? Thank you for everything. Thank you for the inspiration. And live long and prosper. Happy 30th to you. And many more. Those last two folks are guest stars <clears throat> from the original series, Star Trek. Um, like a back here a bit where it's brighter. Barbara Luna played the Captain's Women in the Mirror Mirror episode in season two of Trek. And Mike Forrest played Apollo in the uh, Who Mourns for Adonais episode where the Enterprise runs into the god Apollo. Uh, before that, I'll mention here, that's Aaron McDonald, who is going to be speaking uh, later today uh, at this conference as well. So if you go to this uh, site on Twitter, again, it's just uh, HPD wishes. Uh, for Hubble under the NASA Hubble site. You can see the long uh, videos from each of these people. Uh, that What I just showed here was a, uh, a, a, little sum, a little sampling of each. We have Josh Peck, uh, Georgia Mary, uh, Miss uh, Ireland here, Figa Riley, uh, Reynold Moore, who did Battlestar Galactica um, and is now doing For All Mankind, producer, executive producer, our own Aaron McMack. Uh, here, Doug Drexler, a uh, big behind the scenes special effects um, artist uh, and graphics artist. Uh, there's again, Barbara Luna and Mike Forrest. Chantal Van Satin is uh, starring now in For All Mankind and is a huge space enthusiast as well. Uh, Trey Calloway, a big uh, TV producer uh, of a whole number of shows he'd recognize. And, the one person who probably doesn't need any introduction here, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And then you'll, if you go further down, you'll see wishes from people uh, all around. We invited folks to, to join our celebrities and wishing Hubble a happy birthday. Uh, so that's one of the fun things we did uh, during that. We also put out uh, this little tool that allowed you, would allow you to go in and see what Hubble saw on your birth month and day, um, not necessarily in the current year, but on, on some year where it captured something interesting. So you could go in and put in today's date if you happen to have a birthday today uh, of August 29th, like so, and hit submit. And it then shows you, oh, this is a big, this is a big day. So you have a birthday today, congratulations. Uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field was taken on August 29th or completed on August 29th in 2009. So you can, uh, you can hide the info here and download the image to put up on your wall or whatever, or you can show the info and find out something about this amazing image that in some level it has turned into your birthday image. And you can do that for any day of the year. It's a lot of fun to play with it. Um, you can use it to send special birthday greetings to your friends um, when their date comes up. We had a, another page, a Flickr album that we produced to try to, uh, show you some of the highlights of 30 years of imaging. Of course, it's impossible to, to capture it properly, but here we have just shown um, 30 select images. There's a lot of images of star formation uh, regions like you see here, where you have large clouds of dust and gas coming together to for, form stars and exoplanets. We have lots of images in their death throes as they start expelling matter in nova and supernova explosions. Um, pictures of external galaxies, uh, two nearby ones on the sky looking at it. This is another uh, circular sphere that's been thrown off by an exploding star called the Bubble Nebula. Westerland 2 was the um, 25th anniversary image for Hubble, another star formation region. And you can go down through here and see some of the, the, the classic myst mystic mountain here, colliding galaxies uh, are, um, 
they're very popular in Missouri, exciting images to see. So I won't go through all of these in detail, but again, feel free to go here to the Hubble Flickr album to find it. Uh, and I'll show you some links later. Uh, yeah, Horsehead Nebula here we have to show as, as well. And we have some stuff from our own solar system. Here's a moon Io orbiting around Jupiter. And this picture is cool because you see the shadow of Io. Uh, the sunlight's coming in from the left here. You see Io itself and then a shadow on the upper cloud decks of Jupiter. So a lot of fun stuff there. Encourage you to go and take a look at it. Um, another telescope that I'm gonna be talking about shortly is a future telescope. It's in design phase now. Um, and we did a, a little video here and I don't, uh, it's four minutes long, so I probably won't show the whole thing, but I wanna show a little bit for you. We call a tale of two telescopes and about uh, science operations for um, Hubble versus what was called W first and now the Nancy Grace Roman telescope, which I'll talk about in a minute, but let me play a little bit of it for you here. Uh, I'm a Dr. Kenneth Carpenter. I'm an astrophysicist. I work, uh, my research area is looking at stars that are both cooler and more evolved than the sun. My name is Mark Postman. I am a distinguished astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute, where I'm currently the chair of the science staff at STSCI. When I first began, I worked as a, a postdoctoral research assistant on one of the original Hubble instruments team. So one of the instruments that was built before launch and was on Hubble when it first launched. I joined that uh, in the mid 1980s. So it's been 36 years since I uh, did that. So I joined Space Telescope Science Institute in the summer of 1989. So that's a little over 30 years ago. Uh, it was when I came onto the staff at SDSCI, it was about eight months prior to the launch of Hubble Space Telescope. And on W first, uh, if you count all of the uh, preliminary, the preceding mission concepts to W first, it's been about 12 years. I have been working on W first in various forms since about the year 2012. Um, one of my roles as head of the community missions office was to help the Institute get a key role in the operations of WFIRST. The aspect of Hubble operations that it made it very unique and has led to the uh, tremendous success of the mission is that it was designed for servicing, uh, designed to be serviced by astronauts using the space shuttle about every three to five years. That meant we could both maintain the mission as things broke, but we could also upgrade the science instruments each time. And that is the secret to how we kept the Hubble mission on the leading edge of science as America's, as the world's premier observatory in space. The main difference between Hubble and WFIRST is that Hubble has a very narrow field of view. It provides great clarity wherever it looks. But any, the size of the patch of sky Hubble can see at any one time is pretty small. In fact, in the 30 years that Hubble has been in operation, even though it's made almost a million observations and it looked at many different parts of the sky, it's actually only imaged about 0.1% of the entire sky. Uh, w first, by contrast, has about 100 times the field of view of Hubble and has the same clarity that Hubble has when it looks at a part of the universe. So it's really gonna change our capability in terms of our ability to map out in very crystal clear quality what we see when we look at the sky. And W first, instead of about uh, 45 square degrees that Hubble has looked at over 30 years, in about five years, W first is going to look at well over 2,000 square degrees of sky. And so it's going to be a real revolution in our ability to study the distant universe, dark matter, and dark energy. I think Hubble has really taught us the importance of really good public outreach. Uh, more than once, uh, the public has come to the rescue of Hubble 
either in getting a service admission signed or in extending its operations. And that's because people feel invested in novel, they feel involved in it, because we've out over the years, we've reached out to them, we've made them feel involved, we've given them access uh, to the beautiful pictures. So it's not just doing wonderful science, which is great and should be a justification all by itself, but it, you know, it means something to me as, as a member of the, the public. I see this stuff, it's like, wow, that is gorgeous. You know, let me get that image and put it up on my desktop or, you know, blow it up and put it up on my wall. And uh, I think you know, that kind of connection to people is very, very important. So I'd like to make sure that we do that for W First um, as well as we've done it for Hubble over the years. What do you mean? Okay, thank you. I ended up letting that run through because I'd forgotten how good it was, although it gave away some of my uh, future uh, plans in, in, in the talk here. Um, but that takes care of everything that was on that slide. For more information, if you want to uh, find out more about Hubble in general, not just the anniversary, uh, go to nasa.gov slash Hubble. And uh, on that page, you can also find a link to all the 30th anniversary material, or you can go through it uh, to it uh, directly on this link here. You can follow Hubble on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, with the handle at NASA Hubble. Uh, you can follow me on my personal Twitter account at Ken Astro, although uh, be warned, you'll get a lot of uh, Star Trek, Disney, and Renaissance Festival info and photos, as well as uh, NASA and Hubble. Okay, um, looking toward the future now, uh, building on the foundation provided by Hubble, we want to go deeper with the James Webb Space Telescope and wider with the what is now called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, uh, previously known as W First, uh, as it was referred to in that older uh, video. So, just to do a size comparison here, this is a Hubble mirror to a 2.5 meter compared to the Webb mirror which has uh, it's a large aperture, it's a segmented telescope, has 18 different segments that are put together uh, and ind independently optically controlled. And then it has a tennis court size sun shield on the uh, bottom of the image here. Uh, just showing you how uh, Webb came together and how it started feeling more real, real to us. The uh, main part of the science part of the telescope was put together at Goddard Space Flight Center where I work. This is it in September 2015, showing the um, uh, back plane and the supporting structure for the mirrors uh, folded up on top and underneath is the supporting structure for the science instruments. Uh, here is Webb. Um, with the mirrors all attached to that supporting structure and in the clean room at Goddard. And we're standing in the observation deck on the mezzanine looking into it. That was a, a popular uh, thing to do back in those days. Here's one of the big tours uh, as late as March 2017 before it shipped out to uh, Houston and then California. And you can see a reflection in there of the crowd on the mezzanine uh, all looking at it. So here's a video. Oops. Here's a video, but I can't get, I've lost my cursor and can't get the sound. So I will, oh, there we go. Let's turn on the sound and then we will start the video. set to a pop possibly recognizable tune to most of you. This is showing it and it's folded up, uh, partially folded up configuration. And 
underside and now showing you a little fully deployed telescope from the top side where the optical uh, mirror is. Okay, so stop back for a moment though and imagine that you could only look at the world through a telephoto lens, as you see here uh, on the left with a camera telephoto, both Hubble and Webb are, are that way. They zoom in at very high magnification, like here if you were looking at Niagara Falls, um, and you, you see a very small area of the sky in detail. Wouldn't it be great to use equivalently, uh, the equivalent of a pair of binoculars and see the whole picture? Well, this is indeed why we're excited, why we are excited about the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, uh, the new name uh, 4W First, designed as Mark Postman said in the earlier video to probe dark energy, the accelerating expansion of the universe, and also look for exoplanets. Uh, so I do wanna take a moment to explain why we renamed the telescope in Nancy Grace Roman's honor. She was a PhD scientist, first woman on the astronomy faculty at the University of Chicago and a recipient of the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. She was the first chief of astronomy and solar physics at NASA back uh, shortly after the formation of NASA, one of the uh, earliest scientists at NASA and certainly one of the earliest uh, females in the agency. First woman to hold an executive position at NASA and she was the literal driving force between the orbiting astronomical, behind the orbiting astronomical observatory, the International Ultraviolet Explorer, a uh, precursor to Hubble, an 18 inch diameter ultraviolet spectral telescope, the Hubble uh, telescope itself, and experiments on Gemini, Apollo, and Skylab. She just an absolute whirlwind, very, very powerful uh, driven scientist to do this. So it's fair to say she was instrumental in establishing a new era of space-based um, astronomy and uh, research in general. And she, of course, was a champion of women in astronomy and a strong advocate uh, of STEM activities. This is a picture of her back, um, I think, in the 70s with the uh, model of the orbiting solar observatory, uh, one of the other observatories she helped make happen. This is her at Goddard, um, I think in the late 60s, uh, in one of the operations uh, control centers. She came back to Goddard for the 25th anniversary. That's her on, on the right there in the white hair uh, in March of, uh, actually she visited in March, 2017. So a little bit, uh, a couple of years after the 25th anniversary, I was uh, privileged to give her a, a talk as part of the festivities. I was kind of scared to death because she is even at uh, her relative advanced age here. She was extraordinarily sharp and brilliant and she was uh, completely unafraid to ask questions. So you always worried that she was gonna catch you on something. Uh, ended up going well, but, and it was a fun um, event. But, uh, even with a small number of people here, it was, um, it was kind of uh, an intriguing <laughs> event. There's a couple of other shots uh, around here. Uh, one to, sh the, person to the left center uh, is the, Dr. Scalise, the center director at the time. Nancy Grace Roman's in the center in the blue dress. To her left is uh, John Mather, the only Nobel laureate at NASA. So we had a pretty good uh, crew here uh, to, to honor and to, to meet her on her visit. She was still able at that point, uh, still energetic enough to sit in the interview chair and uh, do an interview about her life uh, at NASA and the work that she did for Hubble. And I think this is one of the, the neatest pictures to come out of the visit to show how much impact she had on, on getting uh, women into astronomy and into technical fields. The uh, five women on, um, next to, to Nancy here are all active uh, Hubble folks, two engineers on the uh, on our left, on the right, uh, two scientists working in the program, and on the, the far right, uh, one of our outreach specialists uh, at the time working on that. So it's a, a great tribute to her uh, to see this picture and how far we've come since the early 60s. Here's a illustration of uh, observations of the Andromeda galaxy. 
you saw it fly by very quickly in the earlier video that shows that to do a survey of about a third of M31, it took 432 pointings, whereas W first, the Roman telescope, will do it in two. So you can, and in the same amount of in, in very much shorter period of time. So this means not only that you can do temporal surveys of Andromeda, but you can expand this kind of survey to many, many other galaxies. Um, the, the speed with which we'll be able to observe the sky and huge details uh, across a very wide area of sky is just astonishing with Roman. And it gets the same angular resolution as Hubble. So you see the same level of detail over an area that's 100 times larger. So a little graphic uh, of Hubble. And it was a top priority from the uh, 2010 Astrophysics Decadal Survey. Hubble sized telescope, 100 times field of view. And you've seen this comparison before. Uh, looking for dark energy, exoplanet surveys, wide field survey. And it's going to attempt to demonstrate coronagraph instrument technology for use on future missions to study in detail planets around uh, other stars. So the frontier, Hubble provide the foundation. Webb is going for 100 times more power. Uh, Roman for 100 times wider area as we bring it into the future. We'll be looking at some of the biggest questions in modern astronomy with Webb. When do the first stars and galaxies form? How do small galaxies grow into larger galaxies? What do planetary atmospheres look like, uh, et cetera? And then with Roman on the right, we're going to look for other solar systems, but look in the outer regions of solar systems compared to Kepler, which searched in closer to the parent stars. So they're very complementary search techniques. We'll be uh, showing here at the, the bottom. Uh, that shows a coronagraphic exposure where you blot out the light from the star and look for surrounding planets. We're hoping, it's a simulation. We're hoping uh, to, to be able to do that with the coronography demonstration. And of course, we're looking at how and why the universe is expanding, trying to figure out why the expansion is accelerating instead of slowing down. Um, in other words, trying to figure out what dark energy is. We say it's caused by dark energy, but we don't really know what it is. So that's one of the big goals for Roman. And this is just showing again another illustration of the increase in field of view. And to close up, I'm saying beyond Webb and Roman, NASA is continuing its search for life and examining the universe in ultra high definition. Louvoir is a large UV optical infrared telescope concept that's being worked on now to search for life around other stars. I'll show some details here on the upper left, a comparison of uh, what an image in a very distant galaxy would look like with Hubble versus a 15 meter space telescope like Louvoir. It's going to look for life on distant uh, exosolar systems and look for star forming regions throughout uh, the universe and trying to understand the history of star formation. In the lower right, you see a spectrum out in the uh, optical through infrared, seeing where various features uh, will allow you to detect things like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, vegetation, things would be evidence of life. So we'd be using Louvoir to look for concrete signatures of life um, uh, in the atmospheres of other planets. And then someday, great arrays will probe the universe. One of the concepts I've worked on is stellar imager. It's 30 one meter mirrors flying together in formation, all co-focusing on the same distant object and giving us baselines of 500 meters to a kilometer in diameter across the whole array, allowing us to see features on the surfaces of distant stars and looking at their magnetic activity patterns and their influences on the uh, habitability of surrounding planets. And then in the far distant future, a concept like terrestrial planet imager, which is an interferometer like stellar imager that is composed of smaller interferometers and over very much larger uh, baselines, millions of miles between the components rather than hundreds of meters. And the idea there is to image not distant stars only, but the Earth-like planets around them, which is a very, very small and very difficult thing. So I'm going to um, end there and um, stop sharing so we can 
see each other and see if there are any questions. Thanks, Ken. I actually have a question while I'm waiting to see if we have any other questions. Um, I'm not sure people always realize just how complex and technical uh, HST and the other telescopes are. And you, when you were talking about HST, I was realizing just how many systems we had to replace over and over and fix. Um, aside from the improved instruments that are on each one, and those are specific to those telescopes, what other technologies in these upcoming observatories are have their bases in HST and Chandra? That and and I guess concurrent with that is what lessons learned do you have from from earlier telescopes to these later ones? Well, there's a whole variety of things that are way less exciting, perhaps, than the the science instruments. But uh, how to build solar array pop, uh, properly? And we learned with Hubble that a a, a stiffer uh, array that doesn't bounce around due to changes in temperature uh, is a valuable thing. It keeps the telescope more stable and it avoids the problem of the arrays twisting themselves apart uh, if they go back and forth um, too often during transitions. Um, one of the weaknesses of Hubble early on were the power supplies. It seemed like it was impossible to build some power, power supplies that lasted more than about five years. Um, we have now gotten to the point on the latest generation of instruments where things have lasted very much longer than that. So I think whatever the problem was, we solved it. Um, and hopefully we can carry that knowledge forward or, or we have already carried that knowledge forward into web so it won't have that kind of issue. Um, we've of course over the 30 year lifetime of Hubble gone from using physical tape recorders where you actually move a tape through a capstan to solid state recorders and they have, are uh, much more reliable than the tape. They don't break down as often. Although you have to be careful because they can be suspect or uh, subject to uh, high energy particles hitting oh, them yeah. and causing glitches. Yeah. Um, so you wanna make sure you shield things. You also wanna make sure that you build a redundant, uh, not a redundant, a robust system for handling uh, noise hits like that. If a radiation, high, ra high energy particle comes in and blasts the recorder you want the system to recognize it and just kind of do a reset and go on and not take the yeah. telescope out for a day or two while you're looking at it. Do they uh, have a problem with new horizons on that? Uh, I think every observatory has uh, that <laughs> issue at some point or yeah. another. Uh, anything yeah, in our yeah. solar system, at least, where high energy particles can come out of the sun and, and get you yeah. at, at one time or another. Um, so it's, uh, you know, gyroscopes, we're always on the hunt for more precise yeah. gyroscopes and ones that last. Hubble has so much trouble with gyroscopes because they're on the, the bleeding edge of technology because we need such precise pointing. Uh, if you can back off of that a lot, uh, a bit, it's easier to, to maintain a, a gyroscope long-term. I think folks are looking at using laser-based gyroscopes instead of the mechanical ones that we have on Hubble. Uh, on Hubble, you've got a, a float in a fluid that kind of moves around mm -hmm. as the telescope moves and you use that to sense motion. If you can do it uh, with a, a laser reference system, you don't have all those thin, delicate moving parts. Um, so that's another thing we'd like to see happen. Well, in the chat here, Ryland, who I think is one of our youngest astronomers here, wants to know what powers the satellites besides the solar arrays. Well, in Hubble's case, it literally is only the solar arrays. We have no independent power source. And in fact, we have new attitude jets. You saw on Chandra, they actually do have some uh, attitude jets that control its attitude. Hubble does not. Uh, its only power source is electric and its only uh, way of moving at all is by spinning up reaction wheels. So there are three very massive disks of material that are spinning at very high speeds inside Hubble. And when you wanna move the telescope, you use electrical power generated by the arrays or stored in batteries to spin the wheels up in one direction. And then the telescope moves in the other direction because you're in space and there's nothing there to, to hold you in place. So we use the reaction wheels to move the telescope around the sky, you know, point from one part of the sky to another. What we cannot do is change the altitude of the orbit. Uh, that, the wheels don't work that way and we have no uh, jets. So you know, someday we're in danger of crashing down into the atmosphere if we get too low and the, the friction with the atmosphere comes too high. We don't have any immediate problems because the last couple of solar cycles have been very weak and it, they haven't heated up the atmosphere and increased the density at the altitude of Hubble as much as we would have expected 
So we're probably go, good to get into the 2030s without running into Scotty yelling, we're falling out of the sky, Captain, I can't get you enough power. Uh, so we don't think that's gonna happen for a long time. Probably uh, we'll, we'll be safe from that longer than we will from some instrument failure uh, here or there to, to take us out. So Hubble now, since we're not servicing anymore, since we don't have uh, a space shuttle flying, we have to you know, operate it in a way to try to maximize its lifetime and not rely on servicing. But the last servicing was in 2009, so we've gone more than a decade and are still going very strong, knock on wood. And I've got real wood here <laughs> to, uh, to do that on. So, uh, you know, we have to keep that in mind, but so far, so good. Uh, and we certainly have learned how to do uh, servicing. Uh, neither Webb nor Roman are designed to be servicing, but they are designed to not be inconsistent with servicing if we in the future find ways to get out right there. Yeah. They're both going to be harder because they're both going to be out at uh, L2, which is a couple of million kilometers out rather than a couple of hundred miles up over the surface of the earth. Okay, um, I don't know if you can see the questions in the chat, but I can tell you that Chris Cree says, hi, Dr. Ken, thanks for being part of FC3. Hubble has brought so many amazing discoveries to us. Do you have a personal favorite? In terms of an image, I assume that means? Or the discovery of some kind, yeah. Yeah, well, okay, that's, that's, that's two good and separate questions. Favorite discovery is a co-discovery with uh, telescopes on the ground and other ones in space. And that was literally the detection of dark energy in the accelerating expansion of the universe because that is something that was not on anybody's radar prior to Hubble's launch. It was not designed to do anything like that. It was designed to look at the expansion of the universe, but nobody had any idea that dark energy was a thing uh, back then. So that is one of the most impactful discoveries um, that Hubble has been involved in because it says that we don't know quite as much about the physics of the overall universe as we thought we did. Every time we get start to get comfortable and think that we understand at least the basics of how things work, we find something like this, whereas you know, the, the accelerating expansion is kind of like if you took an apple, threw it in the air, and instead of slowing down and coming back down to you, it just started going up faster and faster. I mean, that's what we're seeing in the expansion of the universe. And it's kind of mind blowing. It's completely not intuitive. And we really don't know what's causing it. We call it dark energy. Dark just means we don't know. It you know it's, not really magic or you know, we don't know that it's black necessarily, but dark is as in mysterious. And that's one of the biggest puzzles in modern astronomy. So that's my favorite discovery. My favorite image is of the um, Eta Carina Nebula. There's a huge mosaic put together of this incredibly large area of the sky that would rival anything Roman could do, I'll say. It just took a lot of <laughs> images to do it. Right. But it's, if you look at this image, it's, it's actually available on the Hubble website, you can download it and, and send it out to your favorite photography lab and get a yeah, full size yeah. wall um, mural sorry. that's got so much data in it. But if you put it on a computer, you can fly in and, way, you know, unlike the way. many images where you fly in and start seeing yes. pixels, you can go in and sure. in and in and still see more and more details. And then you discover that this immense image, which is beautiful all by itself, contains inside it some of the most famous yeah. Hubble images like of Mystic Mountain or of Eta Carina are just tiny parts. Yeah. Of, of this huge image. So I, I love that one because you could, it's one of those things you can get lost in when you download the full resolution and put it up on a, a big screen on your desk. Yeah, I have a hard time deciding between that one and, and any and any picture of the Orion Nebula. Well, speaking of the pictures, we've got about four more questions. I'm going to skip down to one for the moment. Uh, Clara wants to know how those pictures from the satellite get to Earth. Uh, how long does it take to download a picture from space? Okay, well, when we take the picture, um, we uh, first, it gets uh, read out of the camera and put onto a, well, tape recorder, I guess we should say a science recorder, because only one of the three recorders on board is still a physical tape recorder. Uh, so nowadays, typically it goes to a uh, solid state recorder. Uh, it sits there until we uh, have a next opportunity to download it. So typically it doesn't come down immediately, but it usually comes down the same day, usually within eight to 12 hours kind of thing. So we have, two or three contacts per day normally. Uh, and we communicate with the ground. We send the data down using what's called TDRIS, the tracking data relay satellite system. These are in orbit, 
Hubble sends the data to a TDRA satellite that sends the data down to the ground, uh, usually at Wallops Flight Facility, and then or White Sands, and then the data goes over landlines to Goddard, and then to the Space Telescope Science Institute for processing. So uh, you know you might have that eight-hour delay to get down to the ground. It goes in a couple hours to Goddard and Space Telescope, and then our criteria requirement is that it be processed and put in the archive within about 48 hours. Typically, it's fa they're faster than that, um, but that's the we aim to get 99% of the data within 48 hours. Um, if it's proprietary data that belongs to the observer, only the original team can see it immediately. Uh, otherwise, you have to wait six months. But there are observations. Some of the almost all of the large programs don't have any proprietary rights, so you could go in and get it within a couple of days if it's part of one of the the treasury or, or large hmm. uh, observing yeah. programs. So Lisa wants to know what programming language runs these telescopes. You know, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not involved in that end of the system. Um, I only know what I had to put up with when I had to put observing requests. Yeah, I know. You know different. On yeah. the Sun Center here, we the yeah. uh, IDL, uh, Interactive Data Language, Python, PyRAF, things like that. How much of that is down in the guts of the system? I'm not sure. I suspect a lot of it uh, really is um, Python and PyRAF nowadays, but I, I wouldn't want to claim that I know that for sure. Machine language, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it could have, you know, in the old days, it was the yeah, original yeah. computer on Hubble. Now, believe this, you know, Hubble flagship of, of NASA, when it launched in 1990, the main computer had 64 kilobits of data. So you can believe the storage yeah, yeah, of RAM. Yeah. So you can believe that that was done in assembly language because you literally, when you change something, you changed it bit by bit because you couldn't afford the space for any kind of high level language. We've now got a, a whopping, hugely capable 486 computer on board, which in comparison has immense storage space. And it's actually all we need. I mean, you may laugh at that because 486s are, I don't know what, a decade old or something now, uh, but they're, they're tried and true. They're tested, they're radiation hard for the most part. So, uh, and it's got all the processing capability that we need. Um, Something like that wouldn't work for Roman where you have these terabits of data coming down because of these wide fields, but it is big enough to uh, store and process the data, kind of data that, that Hubble uh, hmm. presents. All right, a couple more questions here. Um, was the decision to place Han Chandra in HEO a requirement of its X-ray mission? Uh, it almost certainly was. I don't know the, the details for that now. It's that's 20 years ago and not in my field, but um, it, it's in high Earth orbit to, to get it a quieter environment, I suspect. And it's what didn't need to go in low Earth orbit like Hubble because there weren't plans to service it. The reason Hubble is so low and it has to put up with the inconvenience of ha having half the sky blocked out by the Earth uh, during every orbit is because we knew we wanted the shuttle to be able to, to get to it. So it's basically as high as we could go without the shuttle being prevented from getting to it. Uh, since uh, Chandra wasn't being serviced, it was able to go higher, get into a longer term orbit, not have to have all the scheduling complications you get from being in low Earth orbit. So, uh, and it's, my guess is it's probably as high as the launch vehicle was capable of pushing it at the time. So Cosmic Rocker 6, I'm gonna end with this. Have you ever been to space? And if so, is it scary? You wanna tell them about our last trip to space? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have not been in, in space for real. I suspect Carolyn is referring to mission space at, at uh, Epcot at uh, Walt Disney Yeah, World. we rode the, what was it? The green, or the high level uh, yes, one? It, it, you, yeah. you should all take this valuable lesson away from you. If you go to mission space, there is a green ride, which is lower Gs and, and generally more uh, uh, gentle on the system. And then there's a red or orange, I forget. There's a, a, a I think a red uh, line where they put you through more realistic G levels. And I thought I was gonna die when we were on that one. And it's Carolyn's fault because she talked us into going on the red one instead. I thought of you talked me into it, <laughs> but you know, the last time we didn't do that, so. So that is, I mean, if you wanna get a feeling at least for the how it is to launch, 
that actually isn't half bad. They do a pretty good job. They, they use a centrifuge that spins you around and gives you actual G-forces, unlike some of the other simulators. It's not just a, a tilt and tip to fake you into thinking you're you're moving, but they actually push you back. Works into pretty the well. Actually, I think somebody told me that an astronaut took the ride and said it was pretty close to a, to what it felt like for a launch, for the G-forces anyway. I haven't been, you know, for real into space. I don't, you know, uh, I'm, I'm fair, I would love to be, you know, on the moon or uh, see the view in orbit. I don't know if I want to take the risk at this point since there's a lot to enjoy down here. Yeah. If so I have to ask. elevator built, I might try it. I would do that, yeah. So I have to ask, how much time do we have left? Can somebody tell me? You have about one minute or two minutes, but if Dr. Ken wants to expand on anything, he can. Well, there was one other question and then I'll do some cl closing thing. Um, how close are we to seeing those interferometers you talked about? Well, that's an interesting question. There was a, a, a period of time in the early 2000s up to 2005 where NASA and its administrator back then were really interested in these visionary, very bold concepts. And we did a lot of work on a variety of interferometers at all sorts of different wavelengths, all sorts of different science cases. And then when Webb had all its technical difficulties, people got a little spooked at the difficulty, the perceived difficulty of doing an interferometer, which I'm not sure is harder than Webb given all the trouble that Webb had. Uh, so basically the foot was taken off the accelerator. So let's get Webb up into space operating. And then maybe we'll go back and look at these even grander schemes. Um, so in that sense, it may be in the next decade or two even, because there are concepts for larger versions of Webb with the segmented mirrors that might go first. We'll see how that goes. But I will say, uh, I just got a letter uh, two days ago from uh, what's called NIAC, the NASA Innovative Advanced mm -hmm. Concepts competition, I put in a proposal to study uh, putting an interferometer on the surface of the moon in conjunction with the Artemis program, you know, taking advantage of the human infrastructure that might be there. Um, and to my pleasant surprise, it was uh, that proposal was accepted, which didn't get us any money or study. It got us an invite to put in a real proposal. So it's a two-step process. So uh, we're working on that and we'll see if maybe we can um, get people interested in doing something on the surface of the moon, which was always thought to be easier to do it in free space if you didn't have any supporting infrastructure on the moon. But if there's gonna be supporting infrastructure on the moon anyways, all of a sudden that becomes a very interesting place to look at. So that could change the time scale things. I have no idea right now, but um, at least we have, we're having some fun right now looking at the possibilities. Very cool. Well, thank you, Ken. I'm glad you could make it. And you're obviously welcome to check in on all the other uh, talks as well. Our next science talk will be at one o'clock in about an hour with Dr. Aaron 